We are going to be covering a variety of validation methods, and we will also be covering some new math methods. So far, we have covered the random method, and there are quite a few others that are uh, useful. So we are going to, first of all, take a look at character testing methods. And basically, these methods uh, require that you pass a variable or a character. And then depending on the method that you use, it will tell you if uh, the character is a letter or is not a letter, is a number, or if it's not a number. Uh, and the syntax for this is care dot method, uh, whatever the method name is. And then in parentheses, you pass the variable or the value. And the method names can be is digit, is letter, is number, is symbol, is upper, is lower, or is control. And that would be like for a control character. Uh, and these are all case sensitive. Uh, care, the C has to be capitalized. And that is uh, the name of the class. Okay, so then we've got the method name and whatever we are passing. And then the method will return true or false depending on the results of the actual test. So we're gonna take a look at some coding examples so you can see how these are actually used in a program. So this first example, uh, we've got uh, a character called first and we are putting the letter A in it. We have a character called second. We're putting the number one. Character called third. Uh, this is a uh, special control character. Uh, it is above the number six on the keyboard. Uh, it's a caret. And then uh, the variable called fourth, we are putting an escape sequence in for tabbing. And so what we're doing then is we are, first of all, we're testing the different variables uh, to see if they are a letter. So here we've got care dot is letter. We're passing it first, which in this case is the letter A. Um, and then if this returns true, because you'll notice that I have it right in the condition for the if. So if this returns a true, that means that first does contain a letter. Okay, so if this is true, we are writing out uh, the value first is a letter, and then we're just checking to see if it's uppercase. So we know it's a letter, so now we're sending it to is upper. And so we're saying if, care is upper, passing it first. Okay, so it's going to evaluate whether it's uppercase or not. It's going to return true or false. So if it's true, that means, yep, it is uppercase. And then we're writing that out. Uh, otherwise, that means it's lowercase. So we're just writing that out because we already know it's a letter. So it's gotta be upper or lowercase. Uh, then we are checking second. Okay, so what is stored in second? Uh, that, I believe, is the number one. The lowercase l and the number one look awfully similar, but I'm pretty sure that is the number one. Um, so this should return false. Okay, so um, if that is the number one, it is not a letter. So it is not going to do anything else. It's false, so it's going to run down to the next line. And third is not a letter either. So we're checking third to see if it's a letter. It is not. Okay, It's a special character, and so it's not going to do any of that code. Then we check fourth to see if that is a letter. And that is not a letter either. It is an escape sequence. Okay, so that is going to return false as well. And then the program is done. And as you can see, the output uh, was only four. 
this very first variable because that is the only one that was actually a letter. And if you kind of want to play with this, you certainly can copy this, paste it into a new program, and you can change the value that's in first, second, third, and fourth, and kind of test it out. Okay, so example two, it is like the first example, but it is testing for a number or a digit. Okay, and variables that test as numbers, well, they should also test as digits. Okay, so uh, when we run this, uh, second is the number one. So that should flag true as a number, but it is also considered a digit. Okay, so uh, when we go through this, we've got care dot is digit first. Well, the letter A is not a digit. So that is not going to be true. That's going to retrieve false. So it's not going to do anything. Uh, then character uh, is number first. Well, that's also going to be false. Um, and then we got character is digit second. Yes, that is going to come back as true. So it's going to print this. And then we are doing character is number second. That should also be true. Okay, so then it should print that. And we get to third and we check, you know, is digit and is number it is a special character. So both of those should test false. And for fourth, that is an escape sequence. So again, this should retrieve false and this should also return false. And you can see that value one is a digit, value one is a number, okay? And so um, the other ones all return false so you don't get any output. So this third example, very similar to the first two, uh, but now we are testing for a symbol or a control character. And in our variables, third has a special symbol, fourth has a control character. And so when we check first, which has an A in it, uh, to see if there's a symbol, it's going to retrieve false. And then, um, if we check first to see if it is a control character, that'll also return false, okay? So it's not gonna print anything out. Then we check second to see if that is the symbol, that is gonna return false. And then we are going to check that second variable to see if it's a control character, that is also gonna return false. And then, we get to the third. And this is a symbol. So it says, if care is symbol third, yes, it is. So that will print out. It's going to say the value third, which is going to be the caret, is a symbol. Okay. And then it is going to see if it is a control character and it is not a control character, okay? It's considered a symbol, uh, so it's not gonna print anything out there. And then for the last one, which is an escape sequence, um, an escape sequence is not considered to be a symbol. So this is going to return false, but it is a control character. Okay, so it is going to print it out, but you can see that it can't really print out what a control character looks like. Um, so it just says the value is a control character. Even though we tried to print it out, it can't print out a slash T. Okay, so that's just how it looks, but it is a control character. So those are the character testing methods. Validation methods. Now, I know a lot of you have been um, adding some validation to your code, which is awesome. 
uh, we're actually going to look at methods that do the debt validation for you. And if a method exists that will do the validation you want to use, it is always better to use the method. The method is standard, the method has been tested. And um, when we get into developing classes, and we get into some of the advanced object-oriented programming concepts, um, it is just better to use the methods. So when possible, use methods, because there's no use reinventing the wheel. So uh, here we've got, is null or empty? So this is gonna check a string to see if there is a value in the string or if it is empty. So you can use this to ensure that something was typed in. And it, it does return a Boolean. It's going to return true or false. So we've got string dot is null or empty. And then you pass it the variable that you want to check. It's going to return true if the string is empty. Uh, if the string has something in it, it returns false, okay? And so we'll take a look at a little programming example. Okay, so we've got a string. Uh, we've got, uh, this is C-sharp programming. We've got another string that we initialize to string.empty. And then we've got a third string that we initialize to null. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pass each one of those strings to is null or empty. And then we're going to see if it retrieves true or false. So here we've got, um, this is for our first result. Uh, so Boolean one, uh, we've got string dot is null or empty. We're passing it as one. Uh, that should definitely retrieve or return false because we have C-sharp programming in there, so it definitely is not null or empty. For the second one, we are sending it string.empty. Okay. So that should retrieve a true. And then for the third one, we assigned it null, so that also should return true. Okay, And then we display the results. So B1 equals, it's gonna display true or false, we believe that it's going to display false because string one is not null or empty. But for B2 and B3, we suspect that they are both going to retrieve true because we set one to string empty and we set one to null. Okay. Um, and another thing how these are quite often used is, um, because they retrieve true or false, they are oftentimes used in a while loop or in an if statement. And so uh, you can use them uh, to check for true or false here as well. So let's look at the output. So B1 was false, which we thought B2 and B3 were true. Okay, um, And that's exactly what we thought the output would be. And so what these if statements are doing is we only want to print, you know, the contents of the string if it is not null or empty. So when we called is null or empty, it retrieves uh, a value of false if there's something there. So we're only gonna get a true if it really is null or empty. So using the results from is null or empty, how do we tell it to print if there's something there? Well, basically we wanna print it if it's not null or empty, right? Uh, so if it's not, true, we want to print it. 
Okay, and of these three, which one was not true? The first one, because that had C sharp programming in it. So when we're checking down here to see which one is not true, we would expect for the first one to be written out because that retrieved a false. Okay, this one was true. This one was true because it was null or empty. Okay, but this one had something in it. And so that is exactly what happened. So the first one was not true, it was false. Okay, but this one was true and this one was true, so we don't print those out. This little method is one that I think you guys are gonna find super useful. I have seen some of you using it already. And uh, what triparse does is it determines if the data they that the user keyed in is basically correct, okay? So what you have to do, it's gonna return a true or false. And you have the data type that you are going to be converting the string to, right? Because when you read things in with console.readline, it reads in and as a string, and we have to convert it. Okay, so this is going to be the data type that you are converting to, dot try parse. This is the string variable that you read in. So we did a console.readline, and we stored it, but it's it's actually a number and we want to convert it, okay? And so this is that variable that we want to convert. Okay? And then we have a comma and the keyword out. And then this is our output variable that if it can convert the string, to the data type we want, it stores it in the output variable. Okay, so that is a new variable that will be used to store the result. And this is used in all sorts of ways. Uh, because it returns a Boolean, you can use it in loops, you can use it in if statements, or you can simply use it to do a conversion. So we're gonna take a look at some coding examples. Um, and this is not going to be an exhaustive list. There's all sorts of different ways that you can utilize this. So in this program, we're asking them to enter a whole number and we're reading in using console.readline, which means we're gonna have a string, okay? And so what we need to do is convert this to an integer. And here we're using int.tryparse as part of an if statement. Okay. So here is the tryparse statement. Uh, and int.tryparse is what we're converting it to. Our string is input. If it can do the conversion, we want it to save the integer as converted number. And so how this works inside an if statement, it's basically if it was able to convert the input into an integer and store it as converted number, if that is true, if that worked, then execute this. Okay, and if that didn't work, if there was a problem, then come down here and execute this. And if it couldn't do the conversion, that really means that the value they entered was not an integer. 
Okay. And so that's what we tell them. Um, and if it can do the conversion, our new integer value is called converted number. And so here we say the original number is, we're writing out converted number, and then we multiply it by 10, and we say the original number multiplied by 10 is, and we show the, show the new value. And the reason we're doing the multiplication is so that you can see that yes, converted number is in fact an integer. We are able to do arithmetic on it and then print it out. Okay, and so here is a sample run. If we did not enter a whole number here, okay, then this is what it would display. Please enter a whole number. We typed in the word 21, and then it gives us the little error message here. Now, normally what would happen if we did not use try parse, we would get an exception error. Uh, the program would stop running. You would go back into Visual Studio and you would see a little data exception box display. Okay, And this allows the program to continue running because if you enter bad input, it just displays an error message. Uh, another example of a bad entry, because we told them to do a whole number, if they do a decimal number. And that is also considered to be bad input, okay? because int.tryparse is not going to work because it is taking that input and trying to convert it to a whole number. And it sees that there's decimals and that is the wrong type of data. So it's gonna come down here and print that message out. Now, one technique that I actually like to use um, because it not only will tell the user that they have entered invalid data, but it makes them type the data again. Basically, it makes it forces them to type correct data. <laughs> so um, here is kind of the same program, but instead of an if statement, we have a while statement. And so um, what it's trying to do is it's trying to take that input and convert it into an integer and store it in converted output. Okay. And if it cannot do that, so there's the not here, if it is not able to convert the input into an integer, it's going to stay in this loop. Okay, the value entered is not a whole, uh, is not a, should be a whole number. Um, please try again. And we read it in again. And it will stay in this loop until they give you a valid whole number. Okay, and when we get the valid whole number, it is going to be stored in converted number. So we fall out of the loop, and then we've got the original number is, we multiply it by 10 so that you can see that, yes, it is actually a value uh, that is an integer and you can do arithmetic, and then we display the results. And so far we've looked at try parse with integer, but uh, you can use try parse with uh, all sorts of different data types. So this example is using it with a double value. Uh, so here we've got double hours worked. Please enter your hours worked and we're reading it in as a string. And then we've got this little, uh, error handling while loop, uh, where it's trying to convert it to double. If it can convert it to double, then it's gonna save the value in hours worked, okay? And if it cannot do the conversion, then we get this error message and we have them enter the value again. And it'll stay in this loop until it can actually make the conversion and store the new value. So by the time we get down here, 
we have the hours worked and it is a legitimate double value. So we've got a similar thing for pay rate. We are declaring it. Uh, we tell them to enter your pay rate. We are inputting it as a string. And then we get into this little error handling while loop. And we're only gonna go into the while loop if they cannot convert that input into a double value. If they can convert it, it'll get converted and stored in payout and it'll be great. It'll go down to the next line and execute it. But if they can't make that conversion, that means the wrong kind of data was entered and we tell them that and we have them enter it again. Okay, so you only stay in this loop if they've entered bad data. If they have entered valid, legitimate data, then you fall out of the loop and execute the next line. And there is an example. And this, these uh, tri-parse methods are very effective error handling uh, methods because you will end up with the correct data. And again, those are for your numeric data types. If you want to validate the string data, usually it's to make sure that it's not null or empty. And you saw how to use is null or empty. And for character data, quite often you're trying to validate to ensure it is a letter or a number or that it's uppercase and all of those character validation methods can be used for that. There are some additional string methods that can be useful. Uh, one of them is called compare to. Uh, and basically it lets you compare two strings or two objects to see if they are the same. Okay, and so the way that this one works is you have two strings. And so you're going to take the first string and call compare to. So it's the first string dot compare to, and in parentheses, you're passing the second one. And then the method is going to see if they are the same or not. It will return a zero if they are the same. Okay, anything uh, other than zero, they are different. So let's take a look at this one. Okay, so you could have the user input like a password or something for this. You know how you always have to enter your passwords twice? Um, that's an example of where compare to is used. Um, in this little coding example, I've got different versions of Happy Halloween. Before I do the comparison, I take each one of these strings and I convert them to lowercase. Uh, because if, if the case is different, upper and lower case, it probably will come back that they are not the same. So we're kind of eliminating that difference. And then, we take the first string and call compare to and pass it the second string. So we're taking string one with happy and we're passing Halloween and we're storing the return value. So clearly these are not the same. So the return value will not be zero, okay? If the return value is equal to zero, they are the same. Well, it clearly is not going to be zero. So it should print that they are not the same, okay? And then we're taking S1, uh, which is happy, comparing it to S3, which is happy Halloween. Again, not the same, okay? So the return value is not going to be zero. It's gonna come down here and print out that they are not the same. And then we compare the first string to the fourth. Uh, we have converted everything to lowercase. 
So these are the same, okay? Because once we convert them to lowercase, happy is going to equal happy. They are going to be the same. So it's going to return a zero, and then it's going to print that first message. Okay, and so you can see uh, it did exactly what we expected it to do. So equals checks strings to see if they are the same or have the same value. Uh, so it's almost identical to compare to. The only difference is that equals returns a Boolean, whereas compare to is returning a zero if they are the same. Okay, so equal is going to say true, they are the same, the same or false. And it's very similar. You take your first string variable dot equals, and then in parentheses, you're passing your second one. So we've got our happy Halloween example, but instead of using compare to, now we are using equals. And so um, it's first going to check to see if happy is equal to Halloween, which it clearly is not. So we would expect it to print not the same. Uh, and then we're checking happy and happy Halloween. Again, uh, they are not the same. So we would expect it to return false. His return value this time is going to be true or false. Uh, so I would expect it to come down here. Okay, and then uh, is happy equal to happy? Yes, it is. So I would expect return value to be true. So it will print out the first one. And that is exactly what it does. Now these next two uh, will actually let you look at a string and see, check what it starts with, what the string starts with. And you can also see what the string ends with. So you can send it a letter or you know punctuation mark that you want to check at the end of the string for, and you can send it a letter uh, that you want to check the beginning of the string for. Okay, and it both of them are going to return true or false. So with ends with, you have your first string, your string variable, you call ends with, so it's the string variable dot ends with, and then these, whatever you pass it here is what you want it to check. And it can be for a single character or it can be a range of characters that you want to check the end of the string for. Okay, and so I think it's useful to look at an example so you can see how that is used. But typically, if you think about what's at the end of a sentence, um, you've got a period, you've got a question mark. And so that is what we are gonna be checking for. Uh, and then we prompt, uh, please enter a sentence and I will tell you about it. So we're reading in whatever they wrote at the council, we're storing it in sentence. And then to check the end, we take our sentence string, we call dot ends with, and we're passing it what we want checked. And the first thing we're gonna check is check end one. So we're just gonna see if there's a period at the end, okay? And so here it will write out your sentence ends with, and then um, it's gonna do a single quote. This is an escape sequence for a single quote. And then it's going to print out a period, okay? So if this is true, Okay, if there's a period at the end, it prints out that. Uh, else if, well, now it's checking the sentence to see if it ends in a question mark. And if that's true, 
again, we're going to print the question mark here. Your sentence ends in a question mark. Um, otherwise, we're just going to print out your it, your uh, sentence doesn't it should be end with uh, a period or a question. Okay, so here I've got, uh, please enter a sentence. I'll tell you about it. Do you like chocolate? Note that we have a question mark there. Uh, and so here it is checking to see if it ends in a period. No, it does not. Uh, here it's checking to see if it ends in a question mark. Yes, it does. And so it says your sentence ends with a question mark. Okay, and then we get the prompt again, please enter a sentence, I'll tell you about it. And then there's a little phrase from a song and a period. Okay, and so then it comes through here, a uh, sentence ends with, first it checks the period, well, that is going to be true. So then it rents, writes out this little phrase. And it is done. So that is ends with, and starts with is similar. Uh, the only difference is instead of looking at the end of the string, it looks at the very first character in the string. Okay, so let's look at a coding example for that. Okay, so how do sentences or, you know, a lot of uh, comments usually start? Well, they start with the word the or the letter A. So that is what we are checking for. Uh, so please enter a sentence and I'll tell you about it. Uh, we read the sentence in. We convert it to lowercase, which is especially important if you are checking, you know, the beginning, because quite often things are capitalized. Okay, and then uh, if sentence dot starts with, it's gonna check for the word the. So if the sentence we keyed in starts with the word the, it's going to print this out. Okay, if it doesn't start with the word the, it's gonna make this check. So, okay, so that one was false. Let's see if it starts with an A. Okay, if that's true, it prints this out. Uh, if that's false, it's basically gonna say, all right, your sentence doesn't start with the, or A. Okay, so here I've got a sentence and I did start it with the, so it does print that out. Uh, here I've got another sentence, which happens to start with the, the word A and it prints that out. Is null or white space? So this checks to see if a string is null or it consists of only white space characters. And it returns either true or false. So you might think, well, isn't this the same as the one we looked at earlier? Not quite. The one we looked at earlier was checking for null but it was checking for empty. This is not checking for empty. It is basically checking for a string that has spaces. So is the string null or does the string only have spaces in it? Okay, so it's a little different than null or empty. So this first one uh, is we've got three strings and you can see we've got content in the first one, second one we set to null and the third one we sent to a bunch of blanks. And then we're checking. So if string dot is null or white space S1, if this is true, okay, then it's gonna print string one contains white space or null. Well, it's not true. Waterfalls is not a space and it is not a null. So this is going to be false. So what it's gonna do is going to print this. You know, uh, waterfalls is a valid string. Then it's gonna check S2. Well, S2 is null. So it says string is null or white space. It is null. 
So it is going to retrieve true. So this is going to test true, and it is going to print that out. And then it's going to check string three. String three is space. So this is also going to be true. So it's going to print string three contains white space or null. In this case, it happens to be white space. Okay, so you can see it did print for string two and string three. So this example uses multiple string and character methods. Uh, the is null or white space and is null or empty methods are used to validate a string. Uh, the string is then run through a loop and each character in the string is checked to see if it is a letter, a number, a symbol, or a space. Total number of each type of characters tallied. Uh, the beginning and ending characters in the phrase are also examined using starts with and ends with. And then once the program ends, we're going to see a summary of the results. So here we've got, uh, because we're going to be tallying the, the number of letters, the number of digits, the number of symbols, uh, the number of spaces and anything else. So we've got these variables that we set to zero. zero. And our phrase, and I'll tell you about it. So we read the phrase that was entered. And first, we are going to make sure that it is not null or white space, uh, null or empty or null or white space. So we're saying, String dot is null or empty phrase or string dot is null or empty or white space phrase. If these are true, if either of these are true, they didn't enter a string. So your phrase cannot be empty or blank. Please try again. And so we're basically here validating that the string has something in it because it cannot be a space and it cannot be null. Okay, so this ensures that the string has something in it. And then once we get through validating the string for content, uh, then you can see that we are taking the phrase and getting the length, which you can do with the string. So remember we use length with arrays. You can do that with the string too. So here, uh, we are going to stay in this loop, and we are basically going to look at every single character in that string, and we are going to determine, you know, if it's a letter, a digit, a symbol, uh, or if it's a blank, or if it's anything else. Okay, so first we are checking, and we are indexing in, and we are grabbing the very first letter, okay, that is at position zero, at index zero. So we're looking at that first letter and we're saying, hmm, is this a letter? If it's true, add one to letter count, okay? Uh, and if it's not true, uh, check to see if it's a digit. You know, is this a digit? If that's true, add one to digit count. If it's not true, let's check to see if it's a symbol. If it's true, add one to symbol count. If it's not true, we're checking to see if maybe it's a blank. Uh, if it is, we add one to space count. Otherwise, if it gets down here, that means every single one of these tested false. So we're just gonna add one to other count. So we know it's not any of those things that we tested. Okay, so this is gonna go through every single letter and space in our phrase and calculate, you know, how many letters, how many digits, how many symbols, and so on. Uh, then we are going to check to see what our phrase starts with. So we're checking to see if it starts with the letter A. And if it does, we're just uh, printing out, yep, your phrase starts with the letter A. Uh, then we're going to check to see if it starts with the word the, because an awful lot of sentences start with the word the. 
And if it does, then we print out, yep, your phrase starts with the word the. And then we check to see if it ends in a period or if it ends in a question mark. And if it does, we uh, print out uh, the appropriate sentence. And then we uh, do a little summary of what our phrase is comprised of. Okay, and so first we give it the letter count. Okay, so that's how many letters are in it. And then we tell it how many digits, how many spaces, and then how many things are not letters, digits, or spaces. So if you want to see this run, and I would encourage you guys to run it. Let's see if I can get it all highlighted here. Helps if you zoom out. All right, I'm gonna copy. And let me pause this while I pull up a project. All right, so here is the code I just copied and pasted. So let us run this. Hopefully. Oops, looks like there is. Oh, it does not like, somehow that got split. All right, let's see. Probably likes it better now. Okay, let's try it again. All right. Uh, love the chocolate. All right, and so the period has 18 letters in it, zero numbers, three spaces, zero symbol, one other character. All right, so I believe that worked. Um, and you guys can kind of play around with it. And if you don't like some of the spacing, uh, you can feel free to fix it. So down here, yeah, I think it probably needs a slash in here. Right, like I said, feel free to fix it if you don't like how that looks. Let's see. Perky. Okay. That looks a little better, but I think you guys get the idea. So those are the different validation methods. Um, we also have some math methods uh, that we're going to take a look at. And we've used math.random, our random number uh, generator. But we have some other methods that we can use. So these are very similar to Excel statistical methods, if you have used those. Um, and also a lot of these methods are uh, similar to methods that are in JavaScript. And so if you have not taken the JavaScript class, you will see them again when you're in JavaScript. Uh, but math.max returns the maximum or the largest. Math.min is the smallest. Math.square root is the square root of the variable that you pass. Absolute returns the absolute or positive value. Um, math that round is actually a pretty useful uh, because it rounds the number to the decimal place provided. So this is how you would code that. Code that. <laughs> you pass it a variable and the number of decimal places that you want. Uh, Math.pow is going to erase a variable uh, by whatever value you pass. So this is the 
like your base variable, and this is the variable that it's going to raise by. Uh, math floor and math ceiling both round. Math floor rounds down, math ceiling rounds up. Okay, and then math.div remainder returns the remainder from integer division. Okay, so it's very similar to the modulus operator as far as what it returns. Okay, and I do have some examples that show you how to use those different math methods. And so for this first one, uh, we are actually retrieving two random numbers and then we are passing them to math.max, which returns the highest number. And you can see it's returned a double value and we're storing it in highest. And then we're just kind of printing out what the numbers are and what is the higher value. Uh, here we are calling math.min, in which case it's gonna return the lower value. And then we're just printing out that information. Uh, this third case, uh, what we do, oh, we're rounding. So here we've got a couple different numbers we retrieved. And I don't think we've called next.double yet for random numbers. Uh, so this is returning a number with a decimal place. And so what we're doing is we're basically rounding the number uh, to the second decimal place, which is what math.round does. Uh, and for this one, we're using POW. So we are going to raise the first number uh, to the second power, and we are raising that second number to the third power. So what follows the number is the power you are raising it to. And then in here, we are using math.div remainder. Uh, and you can see that you have to be, you have to give it a value uh, that it's going to divide by. So this is your dividend. Uh, the divisor is the number you are, you know, dividing into it. And then it's going to output what the remainder is. Okay, And all this thing is doing is it's checking the remainder, because if there is no remainder, if it's zero, that means we had an even number because we're dividing it by two. And so if it's not equal to zero, that means we have an odd number. Okay, And so I think these are really pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can see that I put this in a menu. Um, and the menu has them choose, you know, if you want the max, the min. Uh, in fact, we can look and see, find the max, find the min, round a number, raise a number, see if a number is even, find the square root, okay, or quit. And so, you know, based on what they pick, it's going to go into these different cases and then call the, the math method. And again, like all the other examples, you can copy and paste this and run it on your own, uh, kind of to see how these work.